All right, we're going to have to do this manually here. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Chat with the Archaeologist. I am, once again, your host, Chester Levosh, and we proudly present this stream on behalf of the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project. We have a couple of announcements to get started, and then we'll hand it over to our guest, Professor Carolyn Dean from the University of California, Santa Cruz. But of course, before we get into that, like I said, some announcements. First off, tours. Yes, we are open for tours. Um, we're going to hit the ground running this spring, so if you're interested in that, you can book a tour on our website. We are still only doing private tours, so that's for groups of four or more. Now, if it's you know, just you or um, just you and your spouse, that's fine. Uh, but the minimum booking fee still covers your four, first four people. So yeah, get three folks to come out and join you. It's certainly worth it. I'm, yeah, I'm biased because uh, of course I work here, but speaking not as an employee of the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project, speaking as a scholar of petroglyphs, pictographs, and other rock images, I do want to emphasize that this is one of the premier petroglyph sites in all of North America. It's really special, so really come out and see it. Certainly worth your time and, and the, the booking cost and bring more friends to. They, they don't know what they're missing if they don't come, so bring them on out. Again, only private tours. Uh, if you have any questions about tours, the best days to reach our tours coordinator are Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. But if you call into the office on any weekday, we will take your call and try to answer your questions. On another note, we are also ramping up our uh, volunteer efforts. So we expect next month to start diving into our volunteer trainings, both for docents and for petroglyph recorders. We're particularly in need of docents to join us this year. So if you're interested in joining us, if you would like to get more experience with the petroglyphs beyond just the tour, then uh, check out the volunteering information that's available on our website, mesoprietapetroglyphs.org. I also want to thank all of our funders who have been supporting us throughout the uh, last couple of years in particular. Um, seasons one and two of this uh, of this webcast were funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities and the New Mexico Humanities Council. So, even though uh, those seasons are over, this stream would not be happening now had they not provided that support. So, um, huge shout out to both of those organizations. And then more recently, the Northern Rio Grande National Heritage Area has provided. Uh, very helpful support and very generous support for our petroglyph recording program. We, of course, um, we need to maintain our equipment and we need certain supplies to be able to record the petroglyphs. And just got a message that we were uh, disconnected, but, but now we're back on. Like I was saying, we, we're also supported by the Northern Rio Grande National Heritage Area. While they do not directly support this stream, they have um, uh, provided, they have helped provide us with the uh, equipment and supplies necessary to do the petroglyph recording and other archaeological efforts that uh, we've presented the results of on this stream. In particular, if you want to look at the episodes from April and July of last year, as well as for a couple of our Mesa talks as well, particularly those of Candy and myself. So thank you for that. And then one final announcement is the Summer Youth Intern Program. That's right, we will be returning for another Summer Youth Intern Program this year. And uh, we've been able to make some changes and, and overcome some of the challenges that COVID presented the last couple of years. While we haven't gotten the specific recruitment information out to the schools quite yet, do look out for that if you're uh, if your high school age student attends an area school, and feel free to contact me, Chester, at mesoparetapetroglyphs.org. My email is on the website. Uh, if you have any questions about that, if you have a student who would be interested. We also have a limited number of competitively awarded diversity scholarships available 
for summer youth interns. So that's right. Um, it, if we don't want money to get in the way, and we don't want our interns to have to choose between participating in this program that, that will give them a leg up on college applications and working a summer job to deal with you know, the realities of the here and now. So we do have a limited number of some modest scholarships, uh, particularly geared towards Pueblo students, indigenous students, and those from the Hispano, Hispana uh, backgrounds. So do consider that when you're considering whether, you're, uh, whether you want your child to apply this year or not. And another point is don't put this off until next year. We can't always guarantee these scholarships or how big they will be from year to year. So this will be a good year for it. This is the year if you have a high school age, teenage kid, um, and, and you think that they could benefit from learning about cultural heritage and natural resources in a STEM and humanities program for two weeks here on the Mesa, lots of outdoor exercise, please apply reach out to me, reach out to us. Our contact information is on the website to get more information about um, what this year's program will entail and how to apply. All right, so without further ado, let's dig in. So I am here today with uh, Professor Carolyn Dean of the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, Professor Dean is in the, uh, is it the, it's the Havoc Department, right? Um, History of Art and Visual Culture? Uh, correct. All right, so uh, for our audience, could you describe what visual culture is? Uh, sure, visual culture is the study of anything uh, where its meaning is derived from uh, its visual components. So that would include uh, everything we would describe as art, as well as things that are described as craft um, and elements of the environment that are viewed as interesting, um, visible, right? So it basically is the study of a much broader concept of, than um, art includes. And um, for uh, some of the returning members of our audience, we've at least attempted to uh, scratch the surface of critiques of the word art. So uh, that ties in very Great. wonderfully with, the, uh, with that. And uh, let's see here. All right, now I, I of course want to give a good introduction to your talk. Um, so it looks like you will be uh, discussing today the persistence of mystery, a case study of Inca masonry. Uh, would you care to describe a little bit of uh, what you're going to be covering in that? Um, sure, although I think it would make more sense just to begin with my slides. All right. Um, I, I do want to say, um, just from the, uh, the blurb here, that this masonry uh, and the significance of Inca stonework to indigenous and Dian peoples of the Inca era. I think my audio is cutting in and out. Um, were you able to catch? All right, maybe, maybe we're back now. Sorry, we're we're having some issues with the uh, with the stream quality. Um, but yeah, um, Professor Dean, now that now we're now that we're back, um, why don't you take it away? Okay, I'm just going to share my screen as a visual. Uh, a student of visual culture. Uh, almost everything I do has a visual component. So um, thank you very much, Chester, for having me uh, here today. Uh, for the last two decades, my research has explored the significance of stone in Inca visual culture, in monuments, and in architecture. So for today's talk, I'll be focusing on the Inca built environment considering the ways the Incas used rock and the meanings stonework conveyed. 
I will also be talking about the many ways people uh, from the colonizing Spaniards in the 16th century to contemporary viewer visitors to the Andes have sought to divorce Inca rock work from the Incas themselves. Uh, first, however, let me provide some historical and cultural context. In the 15th and early 16th centuries, the Incas forged the largest indigenous state in the history of the Americas. It stretched some 3,000 miles along the west coast of South America, uh, and then from that coast to the heights of the Andes Mountains, and then into the heavily forested regions east of the Andes. The map shows you the greatest extent reached by the Inca Empire with Cusco, um, their capital, located in what is today the southern highlands of Peru. In this area from Colombia in the north through much of Chile in the south, the Inca's distinctive architectural style remains as the primary evidence of their imperial occupation. So the Inca built environment is readily recognizable and is different from the architectural styles that came before the Inca and that came after the Inca. So briefly, the Inca built environment is characterized by mostly quadrangular structures with wall batter. Wall batter refers to the uh, inclination of walls so that they uh, slope inward from the outside, as you see in the wall. I hope you can see my cursor on the screen. Uh, all uh, edifices had grass, either hip or gable roofs. Obviously, those were perishable and so no longer exist. And then trapezoidal niches, windows, and doorways. Although utilizing standardized forms, the quality of rock work is dramatically different. In this slide, you see two types of stone building, and the differences are readily apparent. Well, most of the structures in this slide feature high status masonry. Um, I'm gonna use an arrow here to indicate uh, a building of lesser status. The blocks are only roughly worked in the building of lower status. And you can see that mortar has been used to seal the gaps between the stones uh, and hold the blocks together. This is a detail of high status masonry. The Incas worked rock with hammer stones of varying sizes to chip away at rocks in order to, to achieve the desired um, shape. And you see the marks left by uh, their percussive technique on the surfaces of the stones themselves. Final shaping was done by polishing with small stones. Um, and these polishing stones were about the size of guitar picks. The result were stones um, were stones whose wall uh, were, excuse me, were walls whose stones were put together without mortar. They fit precisely uh, and so mortar was not necessary. The Incas called this technique nibbling and they described walls like this as nibbled walls. Hammer stones have been found in quarries and at Inca construction sites. And in modern times, the nibbling technique has been recreated um, by uh, several individuals, most particularly uh, by Professor Jean-Pierre Protzen, who was an architectural historian at the University of California, Berkeley. The nibbling process produced stone blocks that are unique, maintaining individuality while working together to form truly impressive structures. At one level then, nibbled blocks were akin to imperial subjects with each unit or individual working together under Inca direction to create what otherwise would seem impossible. I'll have more to say about this later on. Today, we commonly distinguish between coarse masonry, which you see on the left, and polygonal masonry, masonry, which you see on the right. Both of these kinds of masonry are high status. Right? There, is no, uh, there is no mortar visible between um, any of these blocks on either side. From an Inca perspective, the identification of these two styles represents a distinction without much of a difference because the important aspect of all high status walls is that each individual block 
is unique. Uh, and although I think most of us are drawn to the polygonal masonry today for its distinctive look, in fact, the coarse masonry, the masonry that you see on the left, was actually the more difficult to achieve. Well, Inca walls of high status differ one from another in color and mineral composition, depending on the quarry or the quarries used. The uniqueness of stone blocks is also produced by the fact that each stone is worked individually on site, which means that each block is unique, and so each wall is unique, and so each high status structure is unique. Within the category of high status masonry, there were important distinctions. You can see in this slide two examples of high status masonry, uh, but clearly the wall on the left is more roughly worked than is the wall on the right. The wall on the right is from the most sacred structure in the Inca empire. So the quality of the masonry, the degree of fine nibbling, allows viewers today to, in, uh, to identify the relative importance of Inca structures, even if we may not know uh, the functions of that all those structures served. Keeping in mind that each block is an individual thing, but that each block works together with other individuals to form a wall, we can understand that Inca walls worked to encourage cooperation with the imperial state. So uh, these kinds of walls functioned as part of the Inca's imperial rhetoric. Nibble blocks were not compelled to stay together by any external force, that is to say by mortar, but were themselves the source of unity. At a conceptual level then, high status walls demonstrated the positive outcome of cooperation between diverse entities. As such, high status walls stood as testaments to the accomplishments of the Inca Empire, which brought together and organized distinct peoples who spoke different languages, revered different sacred entities, and, per and pursued diverse interests. Nibble blocks were themselves imperial subjects. To understand better how stone blocks could be understood as persons as, and as metaphorical human beings, I need to tell you an Inca story. Now, this story um, was recorded numerous times in, Span in the Spanish colonial period. And although the story varies in specific details, all versions concern a megalith. The use of megaliths, and um, these are stones weighing many, many tons, are seen at several Inca sites, just as they are here at the site of Sacsayhuaman, which is located just outside Cusco, the imperial capital. Now, the Incas were not the first civilization in the Andes to build with megaliths, but they were unique in the ways they worked the stone and fitted the blocks together without mortar, as you see in this, um, in this photograph. The stool, oh, yes? So, so I keep going? Okay, um, so the, the story about megaliths was twice illustrated in the colonial period, uh, and these are works probably by the same artist. Uh, you see um, both of these illustrations on the screen. The account called the story of the tired stone tells of the megalith that had been quarried and was being moved by laborers to an imperial construction site. We see in both images that the large block is tied with ropes that are used to drag the megalith under the supervision of an Inca official. Both images also indicate that the stone has been roughly worked. And if you can see my cursor, uh, you can see the stone has been squared off uh, in the image on the, what is that, the, the left. And then on the right, again, the marks that the stone has been squared off in the quarry and then will be moved to a site where it will be worked to fit into a nibbled wall. But you can't see the cursor? Yay, okay, that's great. 
Um, so this initial shaping was done in the quarry where blocks were squared off in order to facilitate movement along Inca roadbeds that were covered with uh, pebbles or river stones, um, stones with uh, smooth sides that reduced friction and so enabled the transport of megaliths. According to the story, as the megalith was being pulled away from its home quarry, it began to resist. It grew tired and did not want to go any further. Eventually, its anguish was so great that it began to weep tears of blood, uh, which means heartfelt tears, is tears of deep pain. In the illustration on the right, the artist has drawn great globules streaming from the stone. And in case the viewer has trouble identifying these as tears, uh, the artist has written, and I'm circling it, Joro Sangre La Piedra, a uh, meaning in Spanish, the stone cried blood. On the left, there are no tears, but the stone has two eyes. I will enlarge those for you. Uh, the megalith is being dragged on its back and it looks up imploringly at the Inca official. Recognizing the stone's distress, the Incas decided to leave the stone where it was and not to force it to go any further. The obvious implication of tired stone accounts is that stones could resist Inca efforts. Moreover, the Incas paid attention to the stone's desires. So we may conclude that a wall of work stone, like you see on the right, existed because the stones themselves decided to cooperate with the Incas. They permitted themselves to be quarried, moved, shaped, nibbled, polished, and fitted to join with other cooperative stones to form a wall. A stone wall then was a demonstration of what can be accomplished by beings, whether those are human, stone, or other, when they work together. A nibbled wall comprising cooperative blocks stood as a testament, not just to Inca achievement, but to the power of living beings laboring together to achieve remarkable, uh, uh, remarkable results. As if to affirm Inca oral culture, numerous tired stones are found just off Inca roadbeds where they were abandoned by laborers. Some 50 tired stones have been identified uh, in the Sacred Valley, which is uh, not too far from the imperial capital. Uh, so in sum, we have illustrations showing us how stones of large size were moved by organized human labor. And we have megalithic stones uh, like the tired stones that you see here that provide physical evidence in support of Inca oral culture. An experiment uh, documented by the PBS series, a science series Nova in an episode that first aired in 1997, but is still circulating, uh, showed that human labor could in fact move megaliths of, ex of the size used by the Incas in their construction. In this screenshot uh, from that uh, Nova episode, you see an actual Inca tired stone abandoned by the Incas near a, a citadel in Ollantaytambo that was moved by a workforce comprising indigenous residents of modern Ollantaytambo and some neighboring communities. So the stone that you see tied in the center in the same way as the illustrations we were just looking at is being pulled. Uh, it was abandoned on the way to the citadel and um, the, these people, there are hundreds of them that gathered to show that it could be done, uh, managed to move the stone with actual relative ease once they dislodged it uh, from its base, uh, moved it a couple of blocks across uh, the plaza. With regard to the moving and placement of smaller, but uh, nevertheless still quite heavy stones, we have the eyewitness testimony of Spanish residents of colonial Cusco. They witnessed worked blocks of stone that were being removed by indigenous laborers from the Inca site of Sacsayhuaman, which overlooks Cusco. Um, this was followed by the repurposing of these blocks, again, by indigenous laborers in the building of colonial structures from the homes of Spanish elites to the Cathedral of Cusco, which is what you see in the inset. While most Spanish witnesses did not describe indigenous technology, 
one observer did record the building of earthen ramps to um, haul large stone blocks so that they could sit high on walls. In taking, or rather having, indigenous laborers remove stone blocks from the site of Sacsayhuaman, the Spanish converted the site into a quarry, into a site of pre-worked, readily available stone blocks. As the walls of Sacsayhuaman were reduced in height, structures in Spanish style, like the cathedral, were erected. At least in part, the destruction of Sacsayhuaman was justified to the degree that anybody felt the need for justification by the common belief asserting, um, asserted in the colonial period writings of Spaniards. Uh, and I'm showing you Francisco Pizarro, who was the leader of the Spanish conquistadores. Uh, this belief that I'm talking about was not actually uh, written any, in any, anywhere by Francisco Pizarro since he was illiterate, but it was recorded by his secretary and others um, that Inca sites could only have been built with the help of the devil. And so the production of ruins and the erection of the cathedral are not coincidental. Dismantling one of the most impressive Inca sites of nibbled megalithic construction figured as part of the rhetoric of conquest that was framed as a Christian project performed with the help of God and the saints. So what becomes clear to me is that from the very beginning of colonization, questions were raised about the Inca authorship of both megalithic structures and high status stonework more generally. I find the linkage between the colonial mindset, which routinely denigrated the achievements of colonized populations and ongoing contemporary efforts to question Inca authorship, uh, very troubling. Such questions, especially in the face of evidence like tired stones, eyewitness testimony, and oral culture, as well as visual culture, the illustrations, reverberate with the rhetoric of cultural superiority and even at least arguably, I think, white supremacy. Another allegation originating in the colonial period but persisting to the present holds that giants built the Inca's megalithic structures. Tours at the Inca site of Isla del Sol commonly pause at these uh, so-called footprints as evidence that giants were present in the ancient Andes and must have helped the Incas move the megaliths. Uh, before leaving colonial period ideas to focus on some of the more recent specious theorizing, it is important to note that only a handful of Spaniards in Peru made any efforts to actually answer the question how did the Incas do it? As a group, Spanish settlers asked few questions about Inca technology. In fact, many seem to have preferred fantastical speculation. This also echoes in the writings and thinking of those who continue to discredit Inca achievements in rock work. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the British explorer Percy Fawcett advanced the theory that, snow, that stone softening acids from the Amazon forests were actually used by the Incas to melt away stone to achieve the mortarless fit seen in high status masonry. Although he launched exploration into the Amazon and eventually lost his life in the deep forests of Brazil, he never found these acidic plants. Fawcett's efforts to credit a plant that has never been seen over crediting people that existed in history and who have living descendants in the Andes reminds me of more contemporary efforts to credit extraterrestrials with human achievement. Um, Giorgio Tsoukalos is probably the most famous voice uh, from the ET contingent, but he is certainly not alone in finding it easier to believe in extraterrestrials uh, than to believe that the Incas and other ancient peoples accomplished truly impressive things. In the same episode of Nova, uh, in which contemporary indigenous Peruvians moved that megalith with human labor, a geoscientist formerly of St. Cloud University attempted to cut rock with parabolic mirrors, uh, with, well, with the sun's rays concentrated by parabolic mirrors. Um, although, as I indicated earlier, hammer stones have been shown to be capable of creating nibbled stones in the Inca manner, 
Watkins refused to believe uh, the more obvious method and so per pursue a technology for which there is no uh, physical evidence, no evidence of, of that the Incas manufactured parabolic mirrors, and no evidence that lasers could nibble stone in the Inca manner. And you see here uh, Watkins holding his parabolic mirror uh, with a stone that he did not manage while filming uh, to what he called disaggregate. He did eventually manage to set a popsicle stick um, on fire. So. That was as, as far as um, the experiment went. In the background, however, uh, watching very skeptically, I wanted to point out Jean-Pierre Frotzen, the man who uh, spent years in Inca quarries and at Inca sites gathering what appeared to be hammer stones and then following the technique to show that, in fact, the percussive, um, the percussive use of hammer stones did, in fact, produce uh, the kinds of stones that, um, that comprise nippled walls. It is one thing, I think, to look for answers to the unexplained, and there are many things about Inca technology that are still not fully understood. But to me, the continual questioning of what is already known with a fair degree of certainty suggests that maybe many people really don't want answers, that they enjoy the mystery or maybe even need the mystery. And so the so-called mystery persists alongside fantastical theories that serve primarily, at least as far as I can tell, to perpetuate the sense of mystery. The final instance demonstrating the persistence of mystery in face of clear answers can be found in a vlog cast called Inca Talk that is hosted by uh, Marin Elwood and Peter Frost. Elwood, uh, who you see on the left, is an ethnographic filmmaker and a visual anthropologist Frost is a freelance writer, photographer, and student of Inca culture with decades of experience in the Andes. Inca Talk takes viewers to Inca sites where they are treated to a thorough review of various ruins uh, and treated to a discussion of Inca beliefs and practices with Frost as the primary source of information based on his own observations and his familiarity with current scholarship. Uh, and so I actually do, although I am uh, I will be somewhat critical of the information they present. I actually do encourage you if you're interested to um, uh, to Google Inca Talk and watch some of the episodes. There are, I think, three of them thus far. Elwood's role in Inca Talk is less clear. The vlog cast was her brainchild, but she seems to know uh, very little about the Inca, uh, the Incas, uh, especially the past. She is the voice of the interested newcomer who has many ideas, but apparently little background in ancient Pardon? Oh, oh, okay, sorry, sorry, freaked me out. I thought I was being haunted. Okay, um, so Elwood is the voice of the interested newcomer who has many ideas, but apparently little background. Um, in uh, Inca culture society or in current scholarship. Um, so I wanted to just take a moment and look at some of her, uh, some of what she says on one of the blog casts uh, so that we can think maybe about the way she herself characterizes her aim in presenting Inca talk. Uh, and what I find most interesting is the progression of questions because they go rather quickly from the already answered to the outrageous. Were the stones originally here? Well, in most cases, the source of stone is known. And for those where it is not, uh, contemporary technology, X-ray fluorescence, is capable of providing the answer. Um, that technique was actually explored in the very first episode of Inca Talk. So she already knows the answer to where the stones come from or knows that we are capable of finding out that answer. Um, how were the stones carved is also known. Um, reading the work of uh, Dr. Um, Protzen, and I've supplied a reference here, would answer most questions regarding process. Were they carved or were they poured? Well, were they poured is as wild an idea as is the use of parabolic mirrors. We have the tools used in hammering and nibbling. We have blocks in the process of being worked on site and we have indigenous oral and visual culture supporting um, this other kind of evidence. 
so uh, so that the the kind of insistence on there must be more to it. We must find some kind of a mystery is why I, I, I titled the talk the persistence of mystery because it seems to mystery just keeps uh, folding in on itself. The more answers are actually revealed. So why would mystery be preferred to actually going to um, the scholarship? reading about what is known about Inca technology. That question seems to be answered in the final part of the quotation on the screen when Elwood says, there's an audience out here. And so that brings me to the title of my talk, The Persistence of Mystery. For me, the real intrigue is why people prefer mystery when answers are available. Perhaps people find fantastical theories more entertaining than dry scholarly writing, as hard as that is for me to believe. Um, still, I find it deeply disturbing that ever since the Spanish conquest in the 16th century, people have questioned Inca accomplishments. and Elwood develops as the co-hosts uh, visit various Inca sites. Still, if history is our guide, the so-called mysteries will never be solved. People will prefer to be entertained rather than educated. But there is also an insidious side to the mystification of the indigenous American past. Spaniards, it seems uh, fairly clear, did not want answers because those answers would undercut their justifications for conquest and undermine their claims of cultural superiority. In at least some ways, the persistence of mystery operates similarly today, distracting us from the legacies of colonization, which is across the Americas readily visible and evident in the generational poverty and social inequities faced by indigenous populations today. But we'll see, we'll see if Frost manages to convince Elwood that the Incas were in fact responsible uh, for uh, the ruins that they will be visiting. Um, and so that's the end of my presentation. Hopefully I've given some food for thought and maybe um, opened the possibility of discussion. There we go, wonderful. And actually uh, perfect timing, um, like right on the button. Uh, before we get into the archaeology news stories, and um, see here, Professor Dean, we're having trouble seeing you. Oh, do you want me to stop sharing? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. All right. You're back. Okay. Um, yeah, no, wonderful talk. And uh, you actually might like to know that, you know, I mentioned the summer youth intern program that we do annually each year. Last year, I assigned them uh, two of your... Um, Two of your articles for their uh, readings, oh. um, particu well, thank you. <laughs> uh, particularly on um, uh, the use of uh, Inca masonry for water features, since we have a lot of water diversion features here too. Um, it really struck me that you were talking about the agency of the stones, um, both in in their movement and then in in fitting them together so that they work together to create a wall. And I was wondering if that concept also applies. Um, to the to the water management features as well. Are, are the stones also seen to have agency in, in those cases? I yeah. Well, stones were always were were always capable of animation, 
uh, not all stones were understood to be alive, of course, but the ones that were nibbled had clearly decided to cooperate. And one of the things built out of nibbled stone were those really fancy waterworks that I talked about uh, in that article, where the Inca were using the stonework and the cooperative nature of the stones to draw attention to uh, how they managed water, how they brought water from distant glaciers uh, to sites for bathing, drinking, and agricultural uh, agricultural activity. It offers such a great perspective when, obviously we don't have the, the megalithic constructions here, but um, so, so often the way that we talk about water management here begins with colonization, with, with contact with Onyade in um, 1598. And I feel like we're often missing a part of that story of um, both the indigenous uh, use of um, various water management structures, but also um, like you're talking about the, the, the agency of the stones that the, the place itself was seen to be a part of the community and was actually something that was active in, uh, in doing all of this. Um, yeah, I think some really interesting work is being done in the Amazon where indigenous culture is very much um, sort of alive and they can explain their essentially philosophy or world or worldview. Uh, but it seems to spread way beyond the Amazon as a particularly indigenous American way of thinking about a living environment that various things, and those can be an, um, animals, plants, uh, inert things, water, uh, interact with human beings uh, and so become part of their social world so that the world is bigger than just human beings. That's, and that certainly seems to be the case with the Incas, who engaged all manner of um, all manner of beings. Rocks being one of the most important. Um, Elliot Hilmer, a former banana former banana slug and now PhD candidate at um, uh, Washington State University. Uh, this was um, Elliot was one of our chat guests last year, and. Uh, Ellie is doing their work on um, particularly this interaction between um, indigenous ontologies and the landscapes that, that are seen um, within those ontology, ontologies to be animate, but in a way that's not, um, in a way that is attempting to approach the indigenous viewpoint rather than projecting our, um, our Western scholarly uh, concepts of, of these relational um, sorts of ways of knowing. Mm. So uh, if we're suggesting people out there that uh, our audience should follow up with, um, I, I believe Elliot did just recently have a publication and uh, yeah. And I figure you'd be proud to know that that's coming out of Santa Cruz. <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely visually stunning talk. Um, all, all that masonry is, is really a, a treat for the eyes. I didn't show too much. I can't help it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't sort of divide up comments so I could show as much as I as I possibly could. Yeah. And um, uh, speaking of comments, if anyone has any questions for uh, Professor Dean or myself, feel free to uh, put them in the chat. We are uh, monitoring the chat for any questions. Uh, meanwhile, we have a couple of archaeology news stories. Um, and I think I've got most of the technical glitches sorted out here. So, all right. Um, we're going to begin with uh, barbed wire telephones. And uh, this was a, a fascinating story. I first came across it in the context of it being done in Texas, but it turns out that this is something that occurred throughout the Western United States and endured um, well into the 20th century as our... Um, pace of uh, establishing infrastructure um, slowly started uh, to reach in. So um, before the telephone companies could get out to places, uh, we had people making their own phone systems using barbed wire. And uh, on the screen here, and uh, my apologies to any viewers who can only see this in low resolution, but we are showing images of uh, barbed wire here at Mesa Prieta. This is something that um, we often don't pay much attention to, um, even though as, as an archaeologist, 
um, particularly one who has worked in the commercial sector. We're trained to record these things, but often in practice we overlook them. One of the fascinating things about this, is, as I said, uh, it, it wasn't limited to Texas. We have plenty of uh, fine examples of barbed wire being used for telephones here in New Mexico, as well as um, Colorado, Oklahoma, Nevada, and uh, California. Um, uh, again, often we just see a fence, a dilapidated fence, but it's in interesting to consider that this is a sort of ad hoc technology and um, that things like the broken off ends of bottles, which I uh, I have experienced, has just come into my mind going like, oh, right? Um, having wondered why there's just that, that end of the bottle, you know, sitting around the end of a piece of wire or, or, or near uh, broken up bits of, um, you know, what formerly was barbed wire. Now we understand that that was being used as, as an insulator to um, improve the signal of the, these, uh, these phone signals. And the way that it would work is very simple. You'd be able to buy a phone that could tap into it, provide a, uh, just enough power to be able to, to send a signal, and um, you carry it around with you in your saddlebag. And when you need to, um, when you need to, to call out for assistance, um, whether it's uh, dealing with the brush fire, whether you need someone to get in contact with the sheriff because you got, you know, someone someone trying to rustle your cattle out here, um, or whether, you know, you just need to uh, call home and uh, ask when dinner is going to be ready. Uh, you could take this out of your saddlebag, plug it into the wire, and there you go. Um, supposedly, service was atrocious, as many sources uh, will, it's the word that many sources will use, but nonetheless very effective. And... Um, there are very interesting accounts if folks uh, check the sources that I've provided in the descriptions. Um, very interesting accounts of uh, how this was used when phone systems maybe reached as far as the town, but the commercial systems didn't reach out to all the ranches around the town. So we have this sort of tapping in between the commercial and the de facto co-ops um, that are these, you know, ad hoc systems where uh, uh, basically, a housewife is acting as a de facto operator between the, you know, actual professional operator and uh, whoever is out on the barbed wire line. Um, Carolyn, do you want do you want to um, say anything about this, or did you have any comments before we move on? Well, I don't. I yeah, this may be just a bit off the wall, but what the story reminded me of um, was a much earlier technology, uh, not unlike. Um, the you know cups with string that you can use to communicate over shorter distances uh, but around 1100 uh, of the common era the chimu on the north coast of peru uh, who um, where the rulers occupied huge palace complexes they were about the size of four city blocks uh, but they they have actually found in excavations uh, rope that connects two ceramic vessels, very much like the paper cups that I used as children, uh, for rulers who were up in the front part, uh, the fancy part of the palace, to communicate with their kitchens and their servants in the back part of the compound. Um, so uh, that was what the story reminded me of, is the need for communication. Uh, the mother is, um, the uh, need is, the, what is that called, the mother of invention? Uh, necessity is the mother of invention. So, a little off topic, but I hope I'm, I'm interested to, in interesting to people who are interested themselves in archaeological material. I, I wouldn't even say off topic. That's uh, absolutely fascinating. I I had no idea. Um, but that's kind of why we we cover these news stories, right? So we can we can hop off on the the other points of interest and. Um, just, like my mind is absolutely blown about that. Um, did, did I can you send say... you the photograph. There's a great photograph oh, of the. Uh, it, it's it's re very really cool. So I'll do that. Um, and did you say that was the 11th century? Uh, uh it's well the uh, the Chimu generally are dated between 1100 and 1400 of the Common Era. So that's 12th, 13th, 14th century. Okay. 
and Chimu. And were they were they contemporaneous with the Wari? Uh, they were just after the Wari left the North Coast, uh, and they and were actually conquered by the Inca, which is what brought the the Chimu state to an end. Um, thank you. Thank you for uh, refreshing me on uh, South American archaeology too. I have to admit it's it's been a while since since I've uh, done any kind of um, uh, serious study of that. So, uh, well, it's just because you you um, refresh my memory on the joys of barbed wire. I lived for a year in in uh, Lubbock, Texas, and there is a museum of barbed wire there. Uh, so, you reminded me of my interest in that museum was fascinating. So. Uh, you hear that, everyone? If you're passing through Lubbock, Texas, check out the Museum of Barbed Wire. And uh, it, it, on that vein, before we move on to the next story, I, I also want to say um, I also love cattle brands and, or, or livestock brands. And uh, I've stopped at a few uh, roadside museums uh, that uh, have exhibits dedicated to just the, the brands in the area. Um, so that I find absolutely fascinating, too. Um, all right, so next story is going to be the endurance. So uh, the endurance was uh, an ill-fated, but not as badly ill-fated as normally happens for the area uh, expedition to the Antarctic, where uh, they'd set off to land on one side and uh, trek across. This was. Um, I, I believe both a steam-powered and sail-powered ship. So uh, they were able to go under both sail power and steam power even at the same time, a strategy that they used to break into the ice. Uh, as such, the, uh, even though it's a wooden boat, it was also significantly reinforced, supposedly, uh, to handle this sort of ice breaking. But that seems to have still uh, doomed the ship itself as it became uh, trapped in the ice and uh, damaged enough that it, it became clear to the crew that they would not be able to sail back out even if they were freed. Uh, the crew stayed on the boat for a while before the ice shifted and started to take it down. And uh, really a fascinating thing about this for me is that everybody survived. Um, uh, th there was one casualty, the ship's cat. So, uh, you know, Rest in peace, Whiskers, or whatever your name was. Uh, but the rest of the crew, actually, um, even though they were running out of supplies before the ship got uh, sunk, uh, they were able to make it off and um, and make it to a, a pickup point, which I, um, I I tried to do a little um, sleuthing around. I couldn't find out uh, who picked them up where, but um, yeah, they, they survived to tell the tale, so that's absolutely astounding. But if we're going to tie this in with uh, today's theme, the persistence of mystery, well, the mystery about the endurance has been, where does she lie? Um, after all, um, the the ship went down in the Antarctic in the middle of, of an ice field that presumably froze over the, the coming winter. So this thing has been sitting underneath the ice shelf for uh, quite some time. And uh, as you can imagine, um, even, I mean, Folks were skilled with navigating in that day, but it's hard to pinpoint something um, as small as a ship uh, against something as large as a continent and as dynamic as an ice shelf. Um, and so there was a, an expedition launched in uh, 2019 with the broader purpose of studying the changes to the Antarctic ice as a result of um, the ongoing climate change. But a portion of the study was specifically dedicated to trying to find the wreck of the endurance. And just, uh, I believe the press releases were only two days ago, um, which is, I, I think, um, yeah, uh, so, so this, is, this is absolutely fresh. Uh, they've announced that, yes, we did indeed find this. And uh, this was a uh, project funded by um, uh, the, the Falkland Islands uh, of Falkland Maritime Heritage Trust uh, and uh, National Geographic. So um, they, uh, they did a, a sort of cooperative press release uh, through the BBC and, and then uh, through uh, various other media outlets. You can see on the screen here that the ship is in absolutely astounding preservation. And 
Uh, even though I haven't practiced maritime archaeology myself, it's definitely something that I'm interested in, in part because you get these you get these gems. This thing has been sitting at the bottom of the ocean for um, 110 year, or uh, no, 100, when did it go down? It's been sitting under the ocean for over a century, for sure. Um, and yet it, it looks like it just sank. Um, the, not only is the woodwork incredibly well preserved, but you can even uh, see the, the paint on the raised embossed letters endurance on the stern of the ship. Um, absolutely breathtaking find. And of course the, uh, the cold water and um, uh, the cold water definitely helps preserve it. Um, and, and where it is, how deep it is, uh, also means less oxygen, better preservation, but still absolutely, absolutely astounding. Carolyn? Uh, not very much to add, although I do know of, um, there's a museum in St. Louis, I believe, St. Louis, Missouri, that now actually, wait a minute, I think it's Kansas City, that has uh, the, um, that is devoted to the discovery of a ship that was a supply ship further west, but that sunk um, and includes not just all the stuff that was on that ship, shoes and like eyeglasses and all manner of things, but also it does a really wonderful job of talking about how you preserve the actual substance of the ship once it's brought up um, because of course it's waterlogged and they had to re-inject um, some substance, pl a plastic kind of a substance that would, um, so that the ship wouldn't dry out once it was above water. Uh, so it's a, a really, uh, just a really incredibly interesting exhibit, not just about the historical Old West settlement of the Old West, but about how uh, water archaeology, underwater archaeology, um, doesn't have to stay underwater and how things can be preserved that are brought up from, um, from their watery uh, resting places. Uh, yeah, fascinating. Uh, totally a challenge. The moment you move something from, from in situ, it, um, and so, yeah, that's um, astounding the amount of work that it goes into. And, in that it is possible to preserve it once it's taken out of that environment. Um, I want to uh, switch over to the chat uh, very quickly. Uh, we have a couple of comments in the chat. Um, uh, so my mom actually uh, says interesting stuff. Um, so yeah, absolutely. And then Don Potter says, as, as a retired lineman, I find, um, this is regarding the barbed wire. As a retired lineman, I find this very interesting. I never heard of, of a barbed wire telephone. Love it. So, um, thank, thank you everyone for, um, for your feedback. Keep it coming. And then we have, uh, I think one more, one more story, and I don't have a graphic for this, but there have been reports, uh, from, uh, from the war that's, uh, ongoing in Ukraine about the destruction of historical buildings. And, you know, of course we always put human life before, uh, before these uh, structures, but still this seems to be um, one of the unavoidable consequences of armed conflict. Um, whether, it's, whether it's in Ukraine today, whether it was in Syria a few years ago with the demolition um, of, of Palmyra, which is just a travesty, um, or whether it was, um, what, 15, maybe almost 20 years ago, the destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas by the Taliban. Um, this is uh, a, an ongoing travesty, and the, the loss of the, the physical evidence of that cultural heritage is permanently damaging to the communities that value these. Um, Professor Dean, if you have anything to, to add to that. No, I completely agree with you. War breaks things. Um, and not, not just material things, but human beings, et cetera, et cetera. The war breaks things. And so, um, obviously, this isn't a channel to, to cover the, the nitty and gritty of the conflict itself, but it's something that um, I thought we had to, to mention that uh, 
you know, cultural heritage is always damaged. And, and like you said, war breaks things. So, all right. Um, any last comments? Um, maybe let, let's try to end on a positive note. <laughs> See here. Um, we had, uh, well, uh, Professor Dean, you surprised me with that, that story of the, um, uh, of the, the string telephone in the, um, the Chimu, was it, context? Yes, yes. All right. Uh, do, do you have maybe one last surprise for our audience they might, might not have known? Uh, uh oh, um, not, not in that same vein, but I will say that when we were speaking of, of thinking, feeling sentient rocks, that there is a wonderful poem that I don't have memorized, uh, but it is an ode to rocks that had to be destroyed in the building of a new highway. And so while the highway was welcomed in the high Andes, there was a commemoration that rocks had to be destroyed. Oh, poor rocks. Oh, poor pebbles. That's how it begins. And I just, I just don't remember any more of it. But um, it, I guess that wasn't a happy note, was it? Uh-oh, I'm in no, trouble. No, but a very, a very satisfactory uh, closing note. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, thank you to uh, Professor Carolyn Dean for taking the time to join us. And uh, a reminder, like, subscribe, ring the notification bell, interact in the comments, um, boost the algorithm. We've got two more episodes left. Next week, we're going to expand on that maritime archaeology. Uh, we're going to have uh, Darian Day from, uh, from Hawaii uh, come on to the stream and uh, give her talk. So tune in for that. You know what's coming up next. And um, see you all next month.